Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the final study of this week. Now, as we return and we answer questions that we did not get to yesterday and proceed further in our study, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and for his guidance so that we might come into unity and understand that which will be required of us as we walk in the path that he sets before us. Shall we now pray? Loving Father in heaven, we know that we have sinned. We know that we have fallen short of your glory. We turn to you, for there is no other. Direct us today, help us, that as we study, as we discuss, as we pray, we might draw closer to you. <clears throat> help us now, each one. I pray for your blessing upon those that are in this study. I pray for those that will view this study later. We ask now, Father, that your angels attend us, your spirit enlighten us, and that we may be willing to be led where you would have us to walk. <clears throat> Help us to this end. Direct us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, first order of business. William, you had a question yesterday. Yes, I did. It was about okay. the, it's about the midnight and the midnight crowd. What, what particular thing? Okay, yeah, and you said it was Dublin. I agree with you on the Dublin. I thought, but I thought all we all we um we always used uh, Revelation fourteen eight and eighteen to to um have the, it was like a um, second witness to the Dublin. Okay. Well, I, I think primarily it was the reason we have the doubling is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So that's, that's, yeah, that would be correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, plus also, plus also it's the second angel's message. Right. And it's also the message that, that is explicitly repeated. That is, it's going to be, as you pointed out in Revelation 14, and in Revelation 18, so um, so it has that aspects of doubling. So uh, we also see it, uh, you know, lots of doublings in which in the line addressing Joseph. So there's all mm -hmm. kinds of doublings there. And Joseph is the fourth angel's message: Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. So Joseph represents our history. Uh, which is the repeat of Millerite history. So, so our history is the repeat of Millerite history, which is the fourth angel's message that is a doubling in and of itself, uh, because it's the second angel that joins the third angel and gives its gives it gives its power. So, so does that help? Yeah, um, it's also one in Isaiah, I think, twenty-one, where it talks about Babylon is falling and falling. If I had um, state did Isaiah twenty-one? It's Isaiah, it's Jeremiah 1. It might be Jeremiah. You said 21, though? Yeah, I said 21 or 20, yeah. Yeah, it is 21, Isaiah 21, you're right. Fallen, fallen is Babylon, is the yeah. heading in my my Esword Bible. Yeah, which, uh, okay. I mean, that's the heading. Okay, well, that's we still actually say Fallen, fallen in the in the in the verse. I can't find the verse that says it. You don't say it but twice. In, in in, Lord, what's that? It don't. It don't say. It don't say it twice in uh, Isaiah. I thought it said it said it twice in Isaiah eight. Uh, I think it's Isaiah twenty one eight. I think. Is everybody still there? I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking. Find I'm looking at Isaiah twenty one eight. And it reads, and he cried, a lion, my Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set <clears throat> in my ward all nights. Well, then that's the wrong verse. It, it was, um, it's um, either in Jeremiah, where it talks about the Dublin, where it's the Dublin, as um, Babylon is fallen, it's fallen. Isaiah 21, 9. Okay. Yeah. And behold, there cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods. 
he has broken unto the ground. Yeah. So you just were one verse off. It's um it in ba in Jeremiah fifty one eight it says Babylon is suddenly fallen in the King James. So it's suddenly fallen. But uh, uh All right, that, the, the other question I had was is about the uh uh Daniel eight sixteen and seventeen. Yes, sir. I, look, I looked at verse up with for um it says the division in the strong concordance and that's the M E R E H Mara vision. Is that right? In verse sixteen, the vision yeah. make this map. That's the Mara Mara vision. Yeah. Mara vision. All right, and I looked up them uh, a couple of them uh, visions in chapter seven, and it was bringing up um, the Kazomba vision. Now, yeah, if, if you <clears throat> when you're looking at Daniel eight sixteen, we're definitely dealing with the Mareth version. When we come to verse seventeen, it is again the Kazom vision. Yeah. Now, originally, um, I remember that you know, studying this about 40 years ago, I, I had a hard copy of Strong's Concordance. And it actually had made an error in regard to uh, one of the places in Chapter 8. I can't rem remember which place. I it, believe it had it's used the wrong number. Yeah, I believe it was 17 because when I looked it up, they both had the same um, Hebrew number, which is 2377. Yeah. But it both said yeah. more... Okay, so that's interesting because if you take Daniel eight seventeen, read in reverse, it's seven eighteen, right? Which is July eighteen, and it's the one that had uh, the error, right? Um, I don't know if that's significant or not, <laughs> but yeah, I was pretty sure it was that verse. Um, at the time of the end, shall be it. It says in the original Strong's hard copy, uh, Mara, and. Um, so, uh, you know, fortunately, I had also um, an intervenier, uh, King James. Um, can't remember what's the guy's name. Kind of on the tip of my tongue. Green was the, was the uh, guy who put that together. He also did a, a, a translation of, of the Bible. His translation and the interveners was a separate translation. Jay, I think his first name was Jay P. Green. But anyway, um, so that so that's how I knew that the Strong's was wrong. I could look at the Hebrew, but uh, no, that was yeah, they, I'm sorry. That, that's the What's that? I'm sorry, I misquoted it. The Hebrew number is forty-seven fifty-eight. Yeah, and I'm, right. Yeah, 16. And in verse seventeen. Verse seventeen. I didn't. I didn't. Let's see. Verse seventeen. I didn't get that. And, I don't know oh. why I was thinking. Do you have a hard cover of the Strong's? Yeah, I got a hard cover. No, I ain't got one with me. I got it on my oh, King, yeah. Uh, phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I know. I know. There's one place where it, it. It. I'm not sure which one it is, but I'm trying to remember. Um, but I know one place it says Mara when it should say Kazong. Um, that would make sense that it's verse 17, but. In, verse, in chapter 8, 12, and 13, wait a minute, chapter 8, 1, and 2, it's a Kazon vision. Yeah, I know. And it's not until verse 15 that Mara shows up as the word yeah. appearance, right? Uh, but then yeah. in verse 16, it's the first time it's translated as vision in the King James. Okay. I, I can't remember if it, was 16, if it was 16 or 17. One of those verses, it had the wrong number um, in the, the strongest hard copy that I had back 40 years ago. All right. And it's a quote, one in, one in Daniel 7, 2, 7, 2, it is, uh, is the uh, 2376. Yeah, that's just Aramaic, just for Kazone. That's the Aramaic version. Aramaic yeah, version, okay. Yeah, that's why. 
so they, it's it's in a different language. So the number is one number off, but it's it's basically the same word. It's it's has the same meaning. Okay, that helps. okay, that about does all my questions for today. <laughs> but yeah. I thought I was okay. Okay. well, thanks. <laughs> now, as we were addressing and we were completing this portion of Daniel 10. Smith made the comments that Gabriel then announced that none, God of course accepted, had an understanding with him in the matters he was about to communicate, except Michael the Prince. So he returns to this twice. He's stating that God understands what's going on. He understands that Michael, one who is like God, understands and that he is accepting that the word that he has received through them is correct. And after he had made them known to Daniel, there were four beings in the universe with whom rested a knowledge of these important truths. Daniel, Gabriel, Christ, and God. Four links in this chain of witnesses. The first, the highest being in the universe. The last, a member of the human family. Verily, the whole race is ennobled by so noble a member. The fact here stated shows the propriety of the language of Revelation 1.1, where Jesus Christ is introduced and Gabriel is spoken of as his angel. He was the angel who alone had knowledge with Christ and of these revelations, which were to be made to his people. Now, it's interesting to me because in the past I have had those that have argued with me that Gabriel is not, quote, his angel, and that it could not be Gabriel that was bringing light to the prophets of God. Yet, Revelation 1, 1 testifies of it. Here in the book of Daniel, it's testified for. So we have two witnesses. Any further thoughts on these questions or these comments. Yeah, well, Ellen White makes it clear, clear as well, right? Correct, so, she does. So these are Adventists you're talking to, right? They are Adventists, yes. Yeah, but they just either don't accept the spirit of prophecy. They're arguing because of William Miller having... I My point at that time was that if this was indeed the case, then it had to be Gabriel that was bringing this light to Miller. Yeah. Well, Elmway makes that clear. I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm certain of that. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was intrigued, William, by your questions yesterday and some of your your comments today. Since midnight numerically is represented as seven twenty one or you know, two one seven. And then, of course, the midnight cry is numerically represented as 815 or 158. So to me, it's just it, it's very intriguing, especially since we have the 158 on the 1843 chart. So now let's see what we've got. So okay, you're, uh, you're opening up the other document. Is that? Yes. Yeah. OK. Here we go. Okay, can you see it? Yep. All right. So now we're, we're segueing into Chapter 11. Initially published 3rd of January of 1870 on the 11th day of the 10th month. So the first now, verse that, here that, reads, Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now, was this the one that the incorrect date there, Dwight? I mean, I can't remember now. No, it is uh, not. No, okay, because we had one, I think it was like January 5th or something that was wrong. Or... Right, the January 5th was the initial article published on the entire study of the book of Daniel. So yeah, and they, they just had the wrong year there. They had the right date, but the wrong year. Correct. Okay, yeah. which, which people do when you switch, when you switch uh, years, you sometimes forget to, uh, uh, we've all written checks at least because we're all older, um, where we've written, you know, the wrong year when we're writing a check in January. Right. Now, 
Brother, the, Brother Dwight, I apologize. In this situation, I... in this in this portion, as the, as the book of Daniel presents, the comment is made also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Who is speaking here? Well, it's going to be Gabriel speaking again. Correct. Because just looked at, he was the one speaking at the end of chapter 10. So, parenthetically, this verse refers back to the first verse of Daniel 10 that stated, In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the Marat. So this part of the bookend of the parentheses is saying that Gabriel stood to confirm and strengthen Darius the Mede. And he came to Daniel in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that Daniel would have the the full knowledge and understanding of the vision of the evening and morning, which was true, which we currently call the okay. 300 days. Okay, so so when he goes back to the first year of Darius, the Mede, right? So that's going to be chapter nine. Right. Now, when when we think about what it, what exactly is being done there, because this isn't going to be referring to the time when Babylon falls. I mean, maybe, maybe it does. Maybe he's going to count that as the first year when Babylon falls and Cyrus is going to, uh, you know, be there as a general of Darius uh, entering into the city of Babylon. It, it could be that. But what is it that Darius the Mead needs to be strengthened about is as far as something that parallels Cyrus issuing the decree. So in the story, story of Darius, what do we have that, you know, because the first year of Darius to meet is, is when Daniel has his vision in chapter 9, but we also have in uh, Daniel chapter 6 that you're going to have um, the story when, and that's going to be Darius, who's the one who throws Daniel in the lion's den, right? And he's going to issue a decree, correct? Correct. Okay, so this could be uh, another indication, which I never thought about before, that we can say that in Chapter 10, the issue is going to be about issuing a decree, right? Right. And if if this is referring to the decree in Chapter 6, where it's in 626, where he says, uh, I make a decree that every dominion of my kingdom men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. In his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Right? So, so that would be an indication that that's where he was stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now, when we look at, um, you know, what is it meaning to confirm, right? Okay. He's going to be confirmed and strengthened. That is, Gabriel's going to be there to confirm and strengthen Darius. So it must be in that decision. We know the story of what, what happens. But would there again been sort of a struggle in with Darius? Obviously there was. And well, he's going to issue a decree. Right. I mean, Darius, as you're pointing out, when when he took the throne of Babylon, at the end of chapter 5, we then come into chapter 6. Daniel is point, appointed as one of three presidents over the 120 or so other administrators, right? Well, he, 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 well there's 120 provinces. I don't know. Uh, I don't think he's – I'm not sure what that – He's an administrator over the 120 provinces, so that I, I would think that it's a kind of uh, policy wonk or something like that. Um, policy analyst, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what his role is. Um, but yeah, I'm just looking, trying to see how they put this. 
Um, I know in, in chapter 6, it starts out, it pleased her eyes to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first, so uh, was first. So there's going to be presidents uh, that the princes might give accounts unto them and the king should have no damage. So I guess he would be more than just a policy wonk. He would be, um, I'm not sure what that role is, these presidents. Um, well, would he? It, 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 in, in Hebrew, it's emir, uh, which we, we can see that word emirate. Right. In, right. Uh, uh, comes from. So it's, you know, and, and this is Chaldee or Aramaic. Uh, so that's obviously uh, related to the word emirate, some kind of territory. So there's three presidents that the princes might give accounts. Now, in this in this case, uh, account has to do with a judicial sentence, an account to be commanded. So, so it definitely has a lot of authority under under Darius. Now, it doesn't say specifically why he is placed there right, in this situation, um, but we, we would probably have something to do with what happens in Chapter 5. Well, so, what, I, what I'm looking at and I'm asking with this, with when we segue into Chapter 6, mm -hmm. Daniel is set in a position where he is technically just under the king. Would that be correct? Yeah, he's under the king. So, he, yeah, exactly what these presidents are. Uh, you know, I'm not particularly certain. Uh, they seem to have some kind of judicial position. But uh... So the point is, <clears throat> Gabriel is reaffirming to Daniel that he was standing with Darius at the time not only that Darius took control of the Babylonian kingdom but at the time where this Ersatz law was being placed before him that resulted in Daniel being cast into the lion's den so is he not telling Daniel I have been with you through the good and through the bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, so, and, and obviously he's speaking to Daniel. So, so he's assuring Daniel that he was there at that time uh, dealing with uh, the situation where Daniel's faith was being tested. Now, uh, you know, I get a little bit technical over some of these chronological details. So when we talk about the first year of Darius, Technically speaking, that would usually be in the spring, right? That it's going to commence. We right. know Babylon fell in the fall. Now, there are a series of events that are going to occur with the fall of Babylon. So, so Daniel's going to be in Babylon, obviously, when it falls, because he's there interpreting the writing on the wall. And what, what kings often do in uh, when they have... The, the a year of their reign um, that that when it comes around it's going to be the Akitu festival that's going to be connected with uh, the king becoming in charge in, in Babylon. Now we know that this is a Median king. Darius is the king of the Medes, and his religion is slightly different. One of the things that, that the ancients did is they would still you just part of God. Okay, so they would honor the gods of the cities or the territories where where they conquered, right? They wouldn't bring in other gods because, especially the Medes. So the Medes, um, uh, they're they're more a um, they're not really conquering people as much as uh, as providing uh, uh, administrative and economic structures that are really going to benefit people, right? They're building roads like the Romans did, right? Um, they're, they're providing, uh, you know, irrigation, uh, administration. And so you have like 120 provinces. I mean, it, it, it's really the laws of the Medes and the Persians 
uh, is really how the Persians conquer for the most part. Now, we see, of course, they do come in and conquer the city of Babylon. But, you know, Darius is going to become the king of Babylon. But he's not going to, like, move his throne to Babylon. He, he's still, you know, over in, uh, you know, probably Elam or someplace like that. I'm not sure exactly where the Median king had his throne. I know that uh, there's going to be the city of Persopolis later. Um, I can't remember the original name of it because that's the Greek's name for the city of the Persians. But anyway, so when it says that it's in the first year of, of Darius that he stood to confirm and strengthen him, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that that story in the lion's den occurs in, in the first year. But what happens with the writing on the wall and, and after that, that wouldn't technically be the first year of Darius. So we could be counting that whole time from his accession uh, to his first year as well. So I just we don't know exactly when Daniel is is set as one of these presidents. Okay, that's, that's all I'm trying to say. We don't know exactly when is that right after the fall of Babylon, or is it more in connection with uh, the spring festival? And, and I would think it's more likely that it happens in the spring festival, the Akitu festival in the spring, um, that he's going to be placed as one of these presidents. And it's going to be then in that year that he's going to be tested over his, his faithfulness to God in prayer. Hopefully that makes sense. My rambling makes sense. Okay. Gabriel continues. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Smith now continues, We enter now upon a prophecy of future events, clothed not in figures and symbols, as in the visions of chapters 2, 7, and 8, but are given mostly in plain language. Many of the signal events of the world's history from the days of Daniel to the end of the world are here brought to view. This prophecy, says Bishop Newton, may not improperly be said to be a comment, an explanation of the vision of chapter 8. What exactly is, is Smith trying to say here? Well, well there's a few points. Now, one of the one of the things that I have problems that we often do when we're going from one chapter to the next, especially in this case, because we know it's all the same vision, and uh, it's going to mention in verse two of Daniel eleven, "I will show thee the truth." Right. So again, you have that word "emeth." Right. So we remember that it says at the end of uh, Daniel ten in verse twenty one, "But I will show thee the truth." But I'll show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Pardon me. And there is none that holds this with me in these things but Michael, your prince. And then you have this parenthetical verse, right, as you pointed out in verse 1. Also in the first year of Darius, the mean, he and I stood to confirm and strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth, right? So that's a continuation of uh, 10 verse 21. I'm going to show you what's in the scripture of truth. And so he's just coming back to the thought. Is is that how you would see that? Good. Right. So that's what, because you, you said that verse one was parenthetical. So you can see why he's, he, he's going to say that. Okay. I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there's none that holdeth with me in these things. But Michael, your prince. And now will I show thee the truth after he mentions uh, the first year of Darius the Mede. Now, uh, behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength through his riches shall he stir up all against the realm of Grisha. So he's first going to start here, um, Darius Smith, to say, well, we're, we're, we're talking about now kings. We're not having symbols like beasts or statues, right? Or, you know, just animals. 
where, where it's talking about kings. So it's, it's a bit more literal, Daniel 11, which we noted when we went through it. But there are still lots of symbols or ideas that we still need to refer to other verses to understand, right? So there, are, there is symbolism here, and, it, and it's tied to the, the explanation of these other, you know, chapter 2, 7, and 8, definitely. It is connected there. But I would think, so, you know, he's, he's going to refer to Bishop Newton, which is a good book. I do have, or at least I gave it to my nephew, like a really old version from the uh, 1600s or 1700s. It's, it's from 1700s. I didn't have a book that old, 1600s. Anyway, it's a really old book of, of Newton on the prophecies. So that's Bishop Newton, Thomas Newton. Uh, and he does a good job. So it kind of gives us the Protestant now, view. Uh, just as a, of as a prophecy. Yeah. Okay, but as as a question, Bishop Newton, did was it attempted to be said that he was a brother of Isaac Newton? Not a brother. He's a relative, and I, I can't remember how he's related. Um, that that's what I remember from years ago. So. Okay. Uh, how, how he was related uh, let's see Thomas Newton if you look him up in Wikipedia uh, and he's Bishop of Bristol in 1761 so I have an edition of of his book from the 1700s right so the 18th century so an early edition doesn't say anything about his being related to Isaac Newton here. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't know where I got that information. I could be wrong. I understood that he's related. Um, I do find it interesting because Thomas Newton was born on the 1st of January of 1704 and died on the 14th of February, 1782. So. Okay. Now, now, what year did um, uh, Miller, what, what was Miller, uh, no, Miller was born on February 15th, but what year was it? Wasn't it 1782? That was. Because he was 16 in 1798. He was, he was so, born February 15th of 1782, yes. Right. So the next day after Thomas Newton dies, William Miller was born. Right, and right. Addressed. And Thomas Newton is, of course, born, born on the first day of the first month, January 1st, right. uh, 1704. Now, now it gives us that date. Um, now, we know that um, the calendar changed over in 1752 in uh, Britain and the U.S. So I don't know if that birth date, January 1st, is the old calendar or new calendar. So I, I would assume... They have both dates in uh, the Gregorian calendar. But uh, uh, when he was born, he would have been born under the, the Julian calendar still because the, the UK, well, England, it didn't uh, change their calendar over in the United States until 1752. So, right. Um, but yeah, it's kind of... Uh, I always, always question these, these birth dates when you're looking at uh, uh, stuff before 1752 for English or Americans. But uh, that's kind of interesting. So the, he dies the next day, uh, you got William Miller. But, but I do think Thomas Newton, his, if you want to have a good view of the Protestant understanding of the, the prophecies of, of the Bible, Prior to you know what ends up happening, you know in the 1800s when the Protestants become Babylon, I mean he is giving a very conservative, a Protestant view. Right, it's definitely not influenced by the Catholics. It's uh, you know day for year prophecies and all that kind of stuff. So that was the understanding at the time in, in the late uh, 17. Uh, well, mid 1700s, really, that he's going to give you uh, that that view of things. 
So anyway, uh, yeah, so 1754 is when he publishes uh, uh, dissertations on the prophecies. And I'm trying to remember the year that I had, it was like 1780 something, 1781, the edition I had, so about 30 years later, around the time he died in, it was 1761, the edition I had. Okay. <clears throat> so Smith, in his comment, is trying to place Daniel 11 as being literal and not clothed, as he says, in symbols. Yeah, we take that view that Daniel 11 is, is, is much more direct in its language regarding history. And, and the plainness of it uh, is, I, I believe, intentional to place the book of Daniel as a strong prophecy regarding what's going to happen historically, um, you know, 400 years later, in particular, I mean, dealing with the kingdom of Greece, because it's going to address that quite a bit in, in pretty direct language. And, and of course, you know, it's going to address uh, all that history of Rome and so forth. So it, it doesn't have as much symbolism, but there still is some symbolism there. Right. But it's not directly uh, symbolism. It's, it's more direct history in advance. The statement here, the angel, after stating that he stood in the first year of Darius to confirm and strengthen him, turns his attention to the future. Three kings shall yet stand up in Persia. To stand up means to reign. Three kings were to reign in Persia, referring doubtless to the immediate successors of Cyrus. These were first Cambyses, son of Cyrus, second, Smyrdas, an imposter, third, Darius, the Stapses. Do we have any comment about what Smith is presenting here? No, it's the same view that we have. Okay. Yeah. The fourth shall be far richer than they all. The fourth king from Cyrus was Xerxes, more famous for his riches than his generalship, and conspicuous in history for the magnificent campaign he organized against Grisha and his utter failure in that enterprise. He was to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Never before had there been such a levy of men for warlike purposes. Never has there been since. His army, according to Herodotus, who lived in that age, consisted of 5,283,220 men. And not content with stirring up the East alone, he enlisted the Carthaginians of the West in his service, who took the field with an additional army of 300,000 men. So that would be 5,583,220 men. Verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside these. The facts stated in these verses plainly point to Alexander and the division of his empire. Here we are to see chapter 8, verse 8. Xerxes was the last Persian king who invaded Grecia. The prophecy therefore passes over the nine successors of Xerxes in the Persian Empire and next introduces Alexander the Great. Having overthrown the Persian Empire, Alexander became absolute monarch of that empire to the fullest extent it was ever possessed by any of the Persian kings. Frido Volume 1, page 378. His dominion was great, including the greater portion of the then known habitable world, and he did according to his will. He will for, his will fortunately led him, B.C. 323, into a drunken debacle in which he fortunately died. 
and his vainglorious and ambitious projects went into sudden, total, and everlasting eclipse. The kingdom was divided, but not for his posterity. It was plucked up for others beside those. Within 15 years after his death, all of his posterity had fallen victims to jealousy and ambition. Not one of the race of Alexander was left to breathe upon the earth. So short is the transit from the highest pinnacle of earthly glory to oblivion and death. The kingdom was rent into four divisions and taken possession of by Alexander's four ablest or perhaps most ambitious and unprincipled generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Any comment on this part? Yeah, I was going to... Uh, I mean, we're not going to... I was going to um, say... What... Wouldn't you um, wouldn't you say that Donald Trump stirred up all the ground of Greece? Well, I, I don't think we want to look here, you know, go through all that stuff again. But yes, Donald Trump did stir up all against the realm of Grecia because Grecia represents the globalists, right. right? And and that's definitely what Trump was doing. I mean, that's pretty clear. It's it's a battle between him and the globalists. Wow. And, and so we looked at that, that that's the battle between the king of the north and the king of the south and so forth. But I don't think we want to look at the President truth application really as we go through this review. I mean, we can refer to it once in a while, but. I would, I would, going bring, I wouldn't going to be too in depth. You know, I just thought it was kind of awesome how that correlates with uh, what's going on now. Uh, I don't see how that correlates with what's going on now. All Trump, right. Trump is in, in power. He's not able to stir up all against the realm of Grecia right now. Right. Uh, you understand, William? I understand. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Because if he's not the president of the United States, he, he can't be stirring up all against the realm of Grecia. He had to have done that before. Right. Okay. I was wondering but, if perhaps it's a type, typo where it says that. Uh, the de the debauch in which he fortunately died is is it perhaps unfortunately died or is it just the use of the English in the day? I would think it's more the use of the English in that day. Yeah, yeah. The word fortunately, fortunately is used that, differently. Uh, because what he what he's basically saying yeah. is that it was fortunate that he died when he did because of the way he was assessing and commanding the then known world. Uh, but I would think fortunate here is like we think of fortunate is like really good, but it's just that mm -hmm. in a sense it would be more in, in the sense of more like chance, right? It, it sort of ordered chance. It, you, you could almost say in God's providence, right? Right, right that sort of idea. But uh, yeah, because <laughs> uh, I don't think Uriah Smith would say, well, it's really good that he died. But fortune came right upon him, or chance, in this situation. Mm. Right, that, that's the way I would look at it. But yeah, yeah, it's not quite the same meaning as we would use fortunately now. It's changed over time. You know, we could say as chance would have it, he died. Right. Right. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, so we see here anyway. You know, getting back to the Xerxes thing. So we, we we know that there is this, when they pass from one kingdom to the next, you know, it, it doesn't go through all these different Persian kings. Right. It's, it's going to go from Xerxes, and that's because Xerxes is going to have this war against Greece in which he's going to be defeated. It becomes this, this focal point where now Greece is the kingdom that we're talking about right now when we talk about the prince of the kingdom of of or, or the prince of grisha pardon me so the pin, prince of grisha yeah so luckily successfully is another one anyway they, so anyway we have the prince of grisha by shall, yeah by chance it yeah. was a favorable thing yeah, favorable yeah okay so um yeah so we're just looking at uh Webster's, the 1828 dictionary. So we 
covered, uh, fortunately. But anyway, here we we see this transition to Greece, uh, but then they're going to mention Alexander. So, so some people just say, well, how does it go from Xerxes to Alexander? Because those are quite removed uh, historically. I mean, uh, we're going to have you know over a hundred years between them, right? Hundred, hundred and four years, whatever it is. Um, you know, so quite quite a long time between them. And and some people would use this. Well, you know, obviously this can't be real history because it just skips like that. Um, now, some people, if they try to do it, they actually try to just, well, that's actually the history. All that Persian king stuff is all wrong. I've read to people like that. They don't, you know, they, well, they're, they're, they're going to actually put a Hazarus and Darius. They're, they're going to have them with these later Persian kings and all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, obviously, I'm not going to consider any of that because we know that this is, uh, Xerxes is the one in the Book of Esther. That's called the Hazarus. And he's going to, in chapter one, be organizing that campaign against Greece, right? And then we're going to see later when uh, Esther uh, comes on the scene uh, that that fits in historically with that history. Like, that's why he's, he, you know, like all the years, everything, and we can account for that in the life of Xerxes. It, it fits perfectly, even though it's in the book of Esther. It's not specifically referring to this campaign against Greece. It doesn't address it directly. It's only indirectly. It doesn't say, you know, here's why he's having this this feast because he's trying to uh, raise funds um, and armies to go against Greece. But, but that's what's happening. So it's kind of interesting. You know, the way the Bible addresses history that is a little bit different than historians would address it, because it looks at it from uh, a prophetic uh, view in context, in context of all of these prophecies that deal with God's people. So it's, it's not just giving us an account of the history. It, it's, it's being selective for symbolic reasons because we know all of this history becomes a type. So if they've given us all these different Persian kings, it sort of lose its, its purpose and its power. So, when, and so I guess the other point then uh, to put there is that when we're making this comparison with our history as prophecy, we take the history primarily from the scriptures itself, not so much from what the historians say, right? Like as far right. as understanding these, these symbols, so uh, what the scriptures tell us, you know, because people will look at some of these things quite differently as historians and how they determine, you know, when a kingdom ends, for instance, and that's one of the problems when it comes to uh, Revelation nine dealing with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. How do you determine? when that prophecy is fulfilled. Well, historians will say, well, the Ottoman Empire continued, you know, for a long time until the 1920s, right? Um, but from a biblical perspective, that wouldn't be correct. So it's going to be August 11th, 1840, that we see the fall of the Ottoman Empire in the context of what the prophecy is addressing. And so similar here, we're, we're going to see, we move to Greece, in the time of Xerxes, as the kingdom that is the kingdom of Bible prophecy, right? So even though we're going to mark Alexander the Great next, we're not going to worry about all those Persian kings uh, because Greece really comes into view when it defeats uh, Persia. That might differ a little bit with how Uriah Smith, or not Uriah Smith, but William Miller places the end of the Persian kingdom. But I think uh, from the context of this, yeah, we're not going to go beyond Xerxes in, in this context, right? And we know we're going to have Arctic Xerxes later. We're going to have Artabanus and so forth. And those are in the scriptures. But 
there is this this transition that happens here. We could say it's a, uh, maybe it's an overlap or a feathering uh, going from uh, Persia to Greece. I don't know if that makes sense. I can see it being basically, you know, step by step. An overlap is an interesting, an interesting term in this. Well, could you say it would be like a, um, like it's a progressive fall? I would think that's possible. Okay, so you know we have Xerxes, right? Then we're going to have Artabanus, which isn't going to be mentioned in the scripture as, at all. And then we're going to have Artaxerxes. So when we think about the different kings that are specifically addressed in the scriptures, we're going to have, of course, Cyrus. Cambyses is going to be mentioned. Balsurdus is going to be mentioned. Xerxes is going to be mentioned as Ahasuerus, right? Is the title given to him. Uh, it's not going to mention Artabanus. It's going to mention Artaxerxes, and um, but we're not going to hear about the ones that follow after Artaxerxes. You know, Darius the second and so forth, right? And other Artaxerxes as well. Um, so there's more Persian kings that have a list of them all here somewhere. So we're not going to have all of the this history. And so for some people that's problematic. They're like, you know, we, we should. We should have all of this history mentioned, but but the Bible doesn't do that because it's not truly giving just history. It's giving prophecy that, that certain history is going to address. Because remember, Daniel's writing this prior to all of this happening. So so he he's picking and choosing these things for symbolic reasons, even though it's a literal history. Right. It, it's it's not going to touch on every single point. Um, okay. That is, in Daniel chapter 11, he's not going to address Artaxerxes at all. Right. Okay. Agreed. Now, isn't that isn't that kind of odd that he's not going to address Artaxerxes when it's going to be Artaxerxes' decree that is going to commence the 2300 days? Right. So you would think, you know, wouldn't he? He mentioned Artaxerxes, but he's not. And and, and so, you know, may, we haven't really discussed why he doesn't, but, but he doesn't, right? So that means that this line of prophecy here, the primary reason that he's writing chapter 10, 11, and 12 is not to really address the beginning of the 70 weeks, but to address these, these progressive kingdoms, right? After the fall of Babylon, uh, he's going to address the kingdoms of Media, Persia, Greece, and pagan and papal Rome, right? So these kingdoms later on and their significance. So that's the kazone, right? That's what he's trying to, well, that's what he's trying to understand, and that's what the angel Gabriel is going to explain to him. So he's not, he already understands. The 70 weeks. He already stand, understands the 2300 days. What he doesn't understand is the Kazon. Could we say that the Kazon was concerning to him because if he's understanding the 2300 and he begins to look at the 2300 and the 2520 in a sequential manner, that he's seeing a very long period of time? Right. So the 2300 days has told him there's this long period of time. So obviously that goes against what uh, Eugene Pruitt was trying to argue, that he wouldn't be shown a long period of time, yet we know he's shown the 2300 days. Exactly. Uh, but he doesn't understand how the 2300 days fits with what he has understood before, right? That is, he, he knows about Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece, and then this diverse kingdom, Right, the diverse beast, right, the, or the feet of chapter two or whatever. Right? So he knows that there is this longer period, uh, but he doesn't understand how they fit together, especially at the end of them, right? That's what he's concerned about, and that's what the angel Gabriel is going to show him. So when we go through chapter 11, one of the things we see is there's the time of the end and the, the Moab. Right, the time appointed, and and that's going to be that forty-five year period, or forty-six, from seventeen ninety-eight to eighteen forty-four. Right. 
So we have that period of time between the time of the end and, or really between the, the end of the two 2520s. And so that's what Daniel has not understood and what's going to be shown in Daniel's last vision. Daniel's last vision is about the 2520, right? That's, that's what we determined when we went through this. And, and, and so obviously that's why Uriah Smith, when we looked at chapter 12, doesn't really understand what's going on there because he doesn't understand the 2520. He's not going to rec recognize the time and time and a half for the scattering of the power of the holy people. He's not going to really understand the end of the 1335. There's just lots that he's not going to be able to see if he doesn't understand the 2520. And so we can see here that what's being addressed is the transition of these kingdoms and their context in which they are dominating God's people, right? That's really what the 2520 is about. And if we think about um, so when we go back to the four seven times in Leviticus 26, uh, there is different levels in which we can understand these, right? So we can understand that there's these four events, the progressive destruction of four. But we know also that Daniel's prophecies are typified by the four seven times, the breaking of the pride of power. Well, that's going to be Daniel chapter 2, wild beasts robbing you of your children. That's the wild beasts of Daniel chapter 7, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Chapter 8 is going to have a bit more complexity to it. It's going to be about the siege and Jehoiachin's captivity and about, um, you know, seven, uh, ten women baking bread in one oven. It's going to be about the quarrel of the covenant, right? Lots of different things that are in there. Um, but that's going to be represented by the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. Right? It's going to be representing that. And then uh, the last one is going to be uh, representing Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12. Right? So it's going to be addressing, uh, and, 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 and in part, chapter 9 as well. And then when we look at each of the four seven times, they also represent the four kingdoms. Right, the pride of your power represents Babylon. Uh, when we look at the wild beasts robbing you of your children, right, it talks about uh, uh, the highways will be desolate. Right, it, it's dealing with a time of disorder, and that's going to parallel Media Persia. And then uh, the third seven times is going to parallel Greece, and the fourth seven times is going to parallel Rome, right, because Rome is the uh, synchronistic power it takes uh, it's like the fourth is going to have all three are repeated Rome takes all of the attributes of Babylon Media Persia and Greece and combines them in its kingdom right does that make sense so there's kind of a, a prophetic matrix that is created with the four seven times it has it parallels the four events and it's talking about the four events which paralyzes parallels the four main lines of prophecy in the book of Daniel, and it also parallels the four kingdoms. Does that make sense? I think the point is logically made. Yeah, and I, I did a paper on it, on the Leviticus 26 Proto Daniel, where I have a chart showing that, how these things line, line up into this type of matrix. And, and so it's very, very interesting that, uh, uh, that we have that. Now, uh, and just one other thing which is sort of, uh, when you look at DNA, uh, how, many, how many letters are there in DNA Three. as a code? There's four. Okay. Right? And uh, it's interesting with DNA because it can be read up and down. If you read up, it, 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 it gives information. If you read down, it gives information. If you read left, it gives information. If you read right, it gives information. Proto just means uh, uh, like a prototype. It's, it contains within it, um, in the book of Le Leviticus 26 is, is, is in a nutshell, uh, Daniel 
the, the book of Daniel is an expansion of the prophecy of Leviticus 26. So anyway, Kelly had asked that question. What does proto mean? But anyway, we can see that these four, I think in DNA, we can kind of see that Leviticus 26 is like the DNA of four seven times are the DNA of Daniel. That makes sense of the prophecies of Daniel. It, they could be read in different ways. I know that's maybe, you know, whether DNA is giving us that information. But it just reminds me because there's the four letters in DNA and we have the four seven times and it can be read in different levels. So, so those are going to be the things that Uriah Smith is going to miss. And, and he's going to miss lots of things as we, we've seen because we missed lots of things in looking at Daniel chapter 11. Okay, continuing to verse five. And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. The king of the north and the king of the south are many times referred to in the remaining portion of this chapter. It becomes therefore essential to an understanding of the prophecy to clearly identify these powers. When Alexander's empire was divided, it was divided toward the four winds of heaven, east, west, north, and south. These divisions, of course, to be reckoned from the standpoint of Palestine. That division of the empire lying west of Palestine would thus constitute the kingdom of the west that lying east, the kingdom of the east, that lying north, the kingdom of the north, and that lying south, the kingdom of the south. The divisions of Alexander's kingdom with respect to Palestine are situated as follows. Cassander had Greece and the adjacent countries, which lay to the west. Lysimachus had Thrace, which then included Asia Minor and the countries lying on the Hell's Point and Bosporus, which lay to the north of Palestine. Ptolemy had Egypt and neighboring countries, which lay to the south, and Seleucus had Syria and Babylon, which lay principally to the east. During the wars and revolutions, which for long ages succeeded, these geographical boundaries were frequently changed or obliterated. Old ones were wiped out and new ones instituted. But whatever changes might occur, these first divisions of the empire must determine the names, or we have no standard by which to test the application of the prophecy. That is, whatever power at any time should occupy the territory which at first constituted the kingdom of the north, that power, so long as it occupied the territory, would be the king of the north. And whatever power should occupy that which at first constituted the kingdom of the south, that power would so long be the king of the south. We speak of only these two because they are the only ones afterwards spoken of in the prophecy. And because, in fact, almost the whole of Alexander's empire finally resolved itself into these two divisions. Cassander was very soon. Yeah, so, uh, just hang on. So, so we can see that that Uriah Smith is already setting up um, for his interpretation of Daniel 11, uh, verse 36 to 45. Right. 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 So he's he's setting all the dominoes in a row there, so that he can make this argument later on. Now, um, now he says here um, something kind of odd. Um, as far as I mean, it's true that you're going to look at these things from the perspective of Palestine, right? right. So you got north and, and the territories, of course, we, we kind of name them a little bit differently nowadays. Right? So we have in, in the modern naming of things. So uh, let me see here. I'm looking at the, the book of this. So I don't have what you have there. What are you um, looking at? Okay. Well, I'm just trying to find what you what you had. Um, okay. Yeah, here it is. I found it. Okay, so he says, 
so north, south, east, north, south, east, and west, these divisions may be reckoned from Palestine. Yeah, so he doesn't go into the details in the book that you have there. So, um, so we have, so it's different. The book is different. Um, right. So he doesn't go, we're situated as follows. He doesn't do that. He doesn't go through that division. So Cassander had Greece and the adjacent countries. That's the West. Lysimachus had Thrace, which then included Asia Minor. Now, now, when we think of the East, here he has Syria and Babylon, right? Okay. Now, now Syria is the area which is later going to be the territory of the North, right? Correct. And 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 so I, I'm not quite sure how to understand that because if he's because he would have to argue that it would be the king of the east and the king of the south. If you get what I'm saying? Correct. Because if Syria is the east, um, then, well, it's going to be uh, Seleucus. And Seleucus is the one that's the king of the north, right? So he says Seleucus had Syria and Babylon, which lay principally to the east. But the Seleucid Empire right. is the northern king. So... Uh, so I'm just trying to sort out why he's he's saying this because since he's going to have Syria, so the Seleucid Empire is being the king of the north, then it should be the king of the east, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? I followed your logic. Yeah. So maybe that's why he took it out later uh, in the book. Is it? Did we, did we, even though he's setting this up to what he's going to say later, uh, it doesn't really fit. Now, you understand that the Seleucid Empire is the king of the north, but here he says Seleucus is the east. Now, we could say, well, the Seleucus occupies and defeats the king of the, the north, right? So it takes over that northern territory. And then actually it takes up everything except Egypt. So it has the west, the east, and the north, the Seleucid Empire, right? Correct? Yeah, because if, if we followed him from his initial point, Lysimachus holding Thrace, Asia Minor, Greece, you know, in that, that area would have been the king of the north. Yeah, so Thrace, yeah, Asia Minor, and yeah, so yeah, exactly. So. But Syndicus would have been the king of the north, and that means uh, whoever occupies the territory of the king of the north would become the king of the north. Right? So we would say, well, Lucas conquered Lysimachus, so he becomes the king of the north. Why wouldn't he be the king? Of so the in this east? in this part, the way that Smith is explaining it, he is definitely setting aside Miller's rules. He is making an application which is doing damage to the verse. Right. And so, yeah, because we can't really just divide them this way. I mean, obviously it's towards the four winds of heaven, right? Right. And, and there's going to be these four kingdoms, these four divisions, which, which we agree upon. But as far as why it's called the king of the north, Babylon is the king of the north, right? Correct. The, even, even prior to this prophecy, why is Babylon the king of the north, even though it's to the east? Well, because it comes from the north, right, in order to conquer. Like, they d generally don't go across the desert uh, with an army, right? So you're going to go up to the north and then come down from the north. If we consider this properly, Babylon being the king of the north, succeeded then by the Medes and the Persians, they were more to the north because they were more northerly than what we would what we would see in this with Greece. And then uh, well the Medes and the Persians the Medes of the Persians are more east than the Babylon. So Persia's way way over to the east. Agreed. Immediately. Babylon is is north of that. Assyria is even further north. Right? And 
uh, between the east you have the desert. So generally you don't cross the desert. So you go up north up the Euphrates, and then you come down from uh, uh, north, basically from Assyria, down through Syria or Aram, right, uh, uh, to conquer Jerusalem. Right, so that's where you're going to come from. Egypt comes from the south. Now Egypt is technically, you know, to the west of of, of Israel, right? But it comes from the south because it comes through the land. So if you're going to have uh, the Egyptian army is going to come into Israel, it's going to come from the south. The Babylonian army, the Assyrian army, they would all come from the north. So from point perspective of Palestine, you just have north and south in which you are going to be conquered, right? Okay. Nobody really comes from the east directly to conquer Palestine, except, you know, their their neighbors to the east, you know, uh, their relatives there, uh, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, right, that are more to the east. And then you have Syria which is more to the north, which is Aram, right? That's the Aramaic, um, where Aramaic comes from. So, so you've got these different kingdoms, but from a biblical perspective, you just have the north and the south. So it's not so much of who's, who's occupying that territory, it's more where they come from. So the north and south are not symbols, or they are symbols of, of two different powers. Babylon and Egypt. So we can see why the Bible is going to talk about the king of the north and the king of the south. Not so much who's occupying the territory of the king of the north. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. So, so his premise is false right from the start. His premise has errors that mm -hmm. he is not able to see. Yeah. And, and this is the basis of all these people who are following Uriah Smith when it comes to so uh, when you, you know, Turkey, when you begin Turkey something with an Turkey. error, you're not following the path, the the truth as it would really be laid out within the Word of God, because then you begin to follow more the Word of man, and this is not what we're to do. Now, we are at the close of our time for today. We need to return to this when we assemble again on Sunday so that we can then finish this thought and go through the next couple of verses. Is there any other comment or question from what we have been addressing today? Okay, so, so when we're going through this here, I mean, what, what we're examining now is sort of, where Uriah Smith goes wrong. Where, so we're, we're, we're picking at flaws of Uriah Smith's commentary, not, not to be hard on Uriah Smith, but to show that there is flaws in how right. he has approached things. We're, we're not going to go through all the details of what we studied already um, in Daniel's last vision. Right. So, I mean, we, we occasionally we refer to some of those things. But it's not going to be a detailed examination of what we already examined in detail. But there are going to be things we notice as we go through this in the context of how we've come to understand Daniel's last vision that, you know, we'll try to highlight. But we should move fairly quickly through his commentary on Daniel chapter 11. And, and it will be a reminder of the historical application. But we will notice the differences. Right. So and, and we'll see why he comes to these these wrong conclusions, because now we understand okay. Daniel chapter 11 much better than we did uh, a year ago. OK. Any other comments? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time that we are able to spend together to learn more, to see more and to be instructed more. We pray, Father, for your guidance through this day. Direct us now. Be with us so that that which is done may be according to your will and that it may represent your character 
and your name to all with whom we come in contact. Thank you, Father, for these blessings. Be with us now. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.